They've gone from the second tier of English rugby just 10 years ago to the brink of European glory. Simmons darting, dummying and scoring! Chiefs surely now headed for the final! What a moment. It's the victory over Toulouse. Exeter Chiefs now in their first ever Heineken Champions Cup final. October the 17th, the date against Racing 92. And I'm now going to be speaking to one of their most famous, most important figures down the years, fly half Gareth Steenson. Thanks very much for having me, guys. Gareth, thanks so much for joining us on the pod. And it has been a remarkable year on the pitch for Exeter. So tell me what the last few days have been like at Sandy Park. The last few days, have, uh, they've been OK, actually. We've um, A few of the lads have had a bit of time off, actually, which has been really quite nice, considering, um, um, obviously, coming off the back of such a big emotional performance. And it's been a, it's been a crazy month, really, with the, the fixtures that have been coming along. And, um, you know, guys are obviously getting an opportunity to play again against London Irish, but um, some fellas have been able to go recharge the batteries. So, um, pretty much, we haven't seen each other since. <laughs> so... Uh, it's uh yeah, it's been it's been great to be able to be in the position we're in. It must have been a bit of a whirlwind too, because this has been such an elongated European campaign, a, a premiership campaign as well. And in fairness to you, you've been very consistent in your performances given the disruption we've all faced. Yeah, no, we have. Look, we've we've come back really well from the uh, the restart. Really, um, you know, it's a lot of credit to the guys. Um, you know, everybody says you've got to train hard in the lockdown period, but um, I, I know guys really put in a big shift. Um, individually um, when we were away from one another and I think uh, we still had a real close group even though we weren't together we were, we were pushing each other every day we were, our SNC guys were amazing they, they were uh, putting up little videos and guys were posting videos of themselves training and I think that has really put us in a good position for when we came back in and um, you know we, we knew that we only had whatever it was eight nine weeks to maximize the potential of the remainder of that season and we've got ourselves into the best possible place we can be at now and you know um there's still hopefully three four weeks left where we can go and get everything that we wanted at the start of last year now take me back to 2008 when you signed from pirates take me back to exeter then and describe the atmosphere describe the place and what the place the club was in at that time well i think at the time whenever i first came to the club um I came and uh, Pete Drewitt signed me at the club and um, it was literally, we. it looked like they were trying to sign the best players from all the clubs at the South West. Obviously, the plan was obviously to try and get up into the Premiership and the plan that year was if we get all the best players from Plymouth, Albion, Cornish, Pirates, Exeter, we get them all in the one place. Uh, basically, like a super club, uh, we'd, we'd win promotion. Uh, that wasn't to be the case. Uh, trying to manage 50 senior blokes at one time is probably not the right way I go about it. Um, but... It was just the way it was. That was what happened when I first came in. There was a real feel-good factor about the club. Um, first day I came up and viewed the place, um, you know, you could see the potential for what the club could be and the dream that was being put forward. And um, you know, you could see that it was a place that was going to go places. And you know, you just wanted to be part of it. And um, obviously, it didn't work out for us the first year that I was here. But I think we got things in, in the place for the, the following season that we, uh, whenever we came into that campaign and uh, we were we were in good position, we, we were confident that we were going to get promotion that year. And you obviously you went on and you were crucial to that victory over Bristol in, in May 2010. And, and you talked there about signing local players, almost unpolished players from the Southwest, guys who had potential, but that potential probably hadn't been recognised. How would you describe the Exeter way? Because loads of people in the press and fans think X to play a certain way. How would you describe it? Because you've been crucial to it. Um, well, it's evolved. It's evolved massively from the day that I first showed up here. Um, yes, there's a certain way that we look to play, especially now. But if I was to go even to three, four years ago, whenever we, were, we won the Premiership for the first time, we don't play the same way we play then. Um, we've just adapted uh, certain ways because the good thing about here is and the coaching staff and the guys coming in we we don't just want to just sit still we don't want to just sit on our laurels we we understand that the game will constantly change and we want to be at the front of that and i suppose whenever right back in those championship days we kind of knew what our strengths were the best thing that i can under, always know is about chiefs is we we always know what our strengths are and um we work really hard on those because if you get your strengths good um your weakness, weaknesses will come i know everyone talks you got to work on your weaknesses but if you can be the strongest at what you do, it's probably a good thing to be. 
I think you said in, a, in an interview I've read that you played with a chip on your shoulder when you first came into the Prem because you, you wanted to prove people wrong. You wanted to uh, almost justify to the rugby world in this part, of, this part of the country why you deserve to be in the Premiership. It, it's a different beast now, isn't it? Because you're the team that everybody wants to beat. Yeah, it is, I suppose. Um, I wouldn't say the chip isn't gone away from the shoulder because there's still a few of us still knocking around who have <laughs> had that for their entire careers. Um, but it was, it was definitely was. When we first came up, you know, we were... We were never meant to win promotion. If you look at anybody, anybody was all saying Bristol were going to go up that year. Even when we went up, sure we were going to not. We we're going to be put straight back out of the competition. You know, we were we weren't ever going to win a game. We finished eighth that year. You know, and then it was always about building, and we always had that because we were always taking little steps all along the way. You were always being told, "Well, you're not ready to do it." We weren't ready to make the Heineken Cup. Even you know, we did that within two years. So you kind of. We have that sort of back, back to the wall mentality for a good few years at the start. Even when we made the Premiership Finals the first time, we weren't meant to win it either. <laughs> we didn't win that one, but we won the one after. So uh, it's probably evolved a little bit now. You know, we're hopefully now getting established uh, as a top team. We want to be known as a, as a top team in Europe. And it's taken us quite a long time to get to even this point as well. So, But we're not, we don't think by any means with the finished article at all. Um, and that's the best thing about the guys in the club. And, um, we're starting to get the young fellas coming through who are wanting to play for Exeter Chiefs, which is amazing. Yeah, we'll come on to them uh, in a short while. Which which games, Gareth, which moments do you think have hurt, defined, shaped your team the most? <laughs> That's a great question. I think every time we got into, um, any time we got into a new competition, you know, uh, when we first came into the Prem, that first Premiership match was huge because that just gave the guys belief that we could do it at this level. Um, and that was the biggest thing even then because by that point, we'd never played a Premiership game. So um, so that was obviously a big, big moment. I think winning the um, LV Cup for the first time was huge as well in 2014 when um, you know, we finally got a trophy, um, which meant that we could spur us on to say, right, we've done that one now. So what's the next thing that we have to go and achieve uh, is the Premiership and work, do better in the Heineken Cup. Um, and I suppose a couple of games, even going over to France, winning, winning our first game over in France and um, the Challenge Cup and then winning it in the, in the Heineken Cup. You know, there's loads of little ones I could, I could mention of. But, um, you know, every time we look to take the field, we want to be better. But I can't think of any one specific one off the top of my head, really. The Premiership final defeats, though, have obviously fueled that desire and, and channeled that hurt. But, but what has that pain taught you about winning the big occasion? I suppose it's just being ready for the big occasion. I can still remember getting into that Prem final and um, it was such an emotional... The semi-final was so emotional to win it, um, you know, to finally get across that hurdle to be in a final. Um and almost when we got into the final, we probably waited for about 50 minutes before we actually turned up in the final. And by that stage against Arsenal, the game was gone. Um, I know we had a bit of a rally near the end, but we never really were going to get back at them. Um, and there was a lot of pain, a lot of hurt coming out of that. And we definitely had, when we came back into the next next year, we almost sort of rolled into the season. and We ended up ninth at one stage. We had one or, one or two games. We were looking really bad. And, I remember Jeff Parling taking us all aside because this guy had just obviously played for the Lions. At that stage, he was our only British Lion. And, um, he'd come in and he had a winning mentality from Leicester and he talked about, we need to, look guys, you can let this season completely disappear or we can knuckle down and do something about it. And We went on some ridiculous run where we, we won like 17 games in a row. And um, I think that that period was probably really really big for us and Jeff definitely was at the front forefront of it too so it just gave us that sort of mentality that let's go out and look to perform and that final probably getting into the final end we probably were in a good spot that we knew that we could win that game too and you guys are deadly inside an opponent's 22 just ruthless levels of accuracy and efficiency and in in pressurized moments I I've never forgotten that try you scored against Saracens in the semi to get to the final and the emotion that of Sandy Park on that occasion. How do you teach that? How do you trust your teammates? Because let's be honest, so many teams at any level listening to this um, have, you know, no no, dime minutes of a match. They they need to score from five metres out or something. But time after time, Exeter and the sense of occasion doesn't get to them. They're able to perform. How do you guys repeatedly do that? It's just trust the process of what we've done. You know, we've just, for instance, that 22, that's, the, the players we've done in there, the hard work, that hasn't just happened overnight. That's We've been talking about that for 
nigh on maybe four or five years. And there's plenty of times which we haven't scored. And there's plenty of times where it hasn't worked. But the guys have now got it. We kind of know what we need to do. And um, But again, we want to make sure that we don't sit still on it. And yes, it's going well at the minute. And we want to stay ahead of the curve because I'm sure if other teams are probably, if they are watching what we're doing, you know, they're probably looking to evolve themselves. And if the, we have to look at other ways of hopefully getting better at it. But at the minute, and um, it's just a trust in everyone doing their jobs and doing it to the maximum of their ability and, um, you know, good review processes and all this. And that's what we're about. We're just about trying to get ourselves better. And um, I think the guys, definitely the coaching staff, have worked really hard on the, on the game plans that we have in different areas of the field. Let's come on to to the individuals that have made Exeter so successful. Starting at the top with with Rob Baxter, he he never. I've interviewed him loads of times in the past. He's always unbelievably calm. He never appears anxious. He never looks as if he's panicking, uh, and his emotions he keeps those in check. Gareth, so give me an understanding of what the real Rob Baxter is really like. Well, in my 12 years or whatever it is here I can count in my hand how many times he's actually lost his head um, and lost his head at half time or anything so that's quite good but yes there is a, there is a time when he can be um, get aggressive and uh, get the guys because at the end of the day he's an emotional bloke too you know he probably he portrays it really well And but the one thing that's really good about Rob is he whatever he says to you guys in the media is exactly what he says to us so you know he's never saying one thing and doing the other thing, which is brilliant. And from a player's point of view, that's all you can ask for from a coach. Just, just someone who, um, you know, is honest with you what, what you're looking to do. And you know whenever you're sitting down with that hard meeting that uh, you've just been told you've been dropped or whatever, you know that he's going to tell you the truth with it, which is a great way to be. And that's just going back to the whole thing when you're asking about the 22 play. It's a trust in the process of how we look to play. And we have a trust um, right amongst the board, right, right from the players, right through the coaching staff. And I think, um, you know, with him right at the top, he's the epitome of everything we want from our head coach. How do you think he's changed in the last 10 years or so? Oh, he's evolved. You know, when I first came here, he was the forwards coach. And then he got the job really for the last three, four weeks of the season because um, I think Pete Drew lost his job with about a month to go. And Rob was literally put in place to literally finish the season off. And, you know, he was very quick to, you know, even at that time, all the coaching staff gone. I remember he brought me and Danny Gray in at the time. He said, look, I don't know anything about backs play, but uh, can you run the backs? So he was putting the trust in me then and Danny to run after the, or look after the back line. And I know that was only for a month before the end of the season, but it's an understanding. He puts the right guys in place. He understands what guys, um, what their strengths are and what they're good at. And, you know, he's obviously evolved as he's went as well, because it's been a learning journey for every one of us. Um, if you were to ask him how even two, three years ago, was he a better coach than he was now than he was then? I'm sure he would answer yes that he is because he's not sitting still. He's looking to get better and that's what we're about. Let's talk about the players that you've grown up with at Sandy Park and, and the ones who are now come through the system and are shining brightly. Um, I mean, Joe Simmons kind of tops the list for me at the moment, along with his brother, Sam Gareth. And, and, and Joe's been brought into your leadership group at Exeter and entrusted with the captaincy. He epitomises everything that's successful about Exeter, isn't he? The way he's come through the ranks and been given opportunity to deliver. Yeah, exactly. You know, um, I would say for a young guy, he has the experiences that he's got under his belt at this stage. I think he's 23 and uh, he's played in a couple of big prem finals. Now, he obviously hasn't been unfortunate on the wrong side of them, but... Um, you know, he's had those experiences under his belt. He's uh, playing unbelievably well. Um, I think the style to, to finally get himself in and be brought into the leadership group was a big moment for him because he needed to develop that part of his game. Obviously, getting the captaincy sort of come on him, probably because of the position that he's in, uh, playing as a number 10. And that just seemed to fit well with uh, the leadership group that we have. And he was on it and he was on the field. But he's, he stepped up to it because he had to. Credit to him. You know, he's got the guys right behind him. Um, he's leading the boys really well. He's, he's become more vocal on a day-to-day -day basis. And, um, you know, his performances alone are a warrant and that guys would follow him. And, you know, he, just the way he plays the game, he's, he wants to go and attack the game. He's a good defensively. I think he's missed like two or three kicks at goal this season all year. And, um, you know, in terms of 
getting the all round finished product. It's it's great that we have a guy like that at that age running the ship at uh, at number ten for us. Well, talking of uh, the Simmons clan, we've funny enough just had the EPCR European Player of the Year shortlist announced, and Sam Simmons is in that final five. So too Stuart Hogg of Exeter. Uh, Semi Randradra, who has been a revelation. I think we always knew he was going to be when he signed for Bristol Bears. And for Racing, Vakatara, of course, just utterly ruthless in midfield. And Finn Russell, who you just feel could still have a big say in, in the destination of this year's uh, title. But on Stuart Hogg, Gareth, just how much of a point of difference has he been for Exeter this year? Yeah, he obviously brings that real attacking quality. That's um, you know not many of it, not many have it in the world. He's uh, he's arguably the best fullback in the world, um, and the way he plays the game is it suits the style of rugby we play. He plays with a smile on his face, which is the main thing. You know, he came down here and it's a big move for Stuart really to to get up sticks and to leave and to come down because obviously up in Scotland he, he's such a big figure and. Um, he was playing some stuff and uh, playing with Glasgow, a club that he's been with his whole career. And then for him to make that move and for his family to make that shift, um, you know, and the, the most infectious thing is he's come down. He says it's the best decision he's ever made. He's delighted to be here. And, you know, that's the kind of thing you want to see these guys. Obviously, he's a superstar of the game, but, you know, he comes in on a day to day basis and he just gets on like one of the lads, which is um, everyone's there's no ego in there. He's just brought it in. And I think that's the biggest thing that's uh, when Rob recruits guys, he, he looks at the bloke, you know, first and foremost, is he a good guy? Yes, he needs to be a good, decent rugby player, but if he's a good guy, um, guys will go to war with you, and that's the best thing that uh, he can do when it comes to recruitment. Hi there, I'm Nigel Owens, and you're listening to the Champions Rugby Show. I want to talk about, about the tournament now, about, about the Heineken Champions Cup and Exeter's place in it. Why do you think you guys haven't reached the heights in Europe up to now? I think it's just the experiences we've had, you know. Um, obviously, now that we have now feel we're a, we're a good established premiership outfit, um, and that was always, it's all about taking little steps. Um, when we get into the Heineken Cup, it was about enjoying these moments and making sure you come out of it the other side better. Um, I think the big moment was when we went to Aviva, um, played Leinster. We were leading with about 20 minutes to go in Dublin. Um, and I've no doubt that if we were in that scenario now, we would win that match and kick on. Whereas at the time, we probably looked around and went, oh, we're playing Leinster in the back garden, in their back garden here, and we're winning. And we probably weren't in a, in a place to finish that match off now. Whereas now I'd say we would be. And I think that was probably the biggest thing, that we just have to have that belief and an understanding that our game will work in the uh, Heineken Cup. I think sometimes we went into games and felt we had to do something um, which wasn't extra Chiefs. But now we feel we've got the game that we've got and we can beat most teams with it. Absolutely. Well, let's reflect on history being made, really, at Sandy Park. An astonishing performance uh, last weekend against Toulouse. Chiefs really Different. beginning to look like the sum of their parts at this point. Here's Ben Moon, one of the originals who's seen the rise of Exeter all the way from the championship. Simmons darting, dummying and scoring! The smiles all around for everyone involved with the Chiefs. Speaks volumes about the team, the trust that they have in one another, the ability to squeeze the life out of the opposition, and then the quality on the field to take the opportunities presented to them. How much of a, an emotional release was that moment, Gareth? I could see it in Joe Simmons' eyes when he went through and, and touched down. He, he could believe in that very moment that you guys were going to a, a Champions Cup final for the first time. Yeah, no, we were exactly the same. Where we were sat on the bench, we were exactly the same. We knew as soon as he went over the line there, that was it. We'd, we'd, I think there might have been 12 minutes or whatever was left, but um, you know we were in a good, comfortable position then. And Yeah, it is absolutely. You know The guys have worked, like I said, so hard for so long to be in a position to do that and um, to do it against such a high-quality side as well. It's just a little disappointing that we, obviously we didn't have supporters in there too because I'm sure the emotional release for all of them as well would have been huge. But look, it is what it is when that in terms of that. But it's huge for us. Um, we're obviously really excited about it. It's probably been quite nice that we've been able to 
sort of chill out for a couple of days after it because once we get back in again, we'll be really excited to get back in amongst the group. And I know there's an incredible buzz around the place and hopefully the guys over the next uh, couple of days can do really well in the Prem too. And then just the small matter of Rusty 92 in the final at Ashton Gate, um, Saturday, October the 17th. Uh, your first ever Champions Cup final and viewers listening to us can watch it live, of course, on BT Sport, on Channel 4, Virgin Media, FR Dirt and BN Sports. Gareth, your thoughts on Racing, really, where you see their major threats coming from? Well, they've got threats right across the board, haven't they? They've got a, a big, strong pack, um, like most French teams do. They've got some incredibly devastating runners out wide as well, but they've got a wee bit of flair in amongst them, obviously, with Finn Russell, what he does. You know, they've just guys right across the board who are good finishers in their game. And we, we're going to have to be in our metal, really. I think I only seen, I haven't actually seen the uh, the game they played at the weekend. I've only seen the scores. And that score they got at the end against Saracens, we all know how good Saracens are when it comes to defensive efforts and squeezing games at the end. And for them to come through with a little bit of magic from a couple of their flair players just shows you they're never out of the game. Um, and we're going to have to be alert for a whole 80 minute performance, 80, 90 minutes, whatever it's going to take to perform. But, you know, we'll uh, get ourselves ready for it. We'll um, obviously, whenever it comes around to it, we'll get the emotional ch- batteries charged. And I'm sure whenever it comes to it, we'll want to go out and put in an extra Chiefs performance. And because we do put our extra Chiefs performance out there, it gives us the best chance of winning the match. And um, we'll be, we'll be on the day. But, you know, it's definitely exciting times. And we're really looking forward to it. How do you shut down two of their most potent weapons? Uh, you alluded to Finn Russell, but also Vakatara as well, because those two on their day can break aside. They can, but you know the best way we can do it is we can probably look to play our game, which means we get to play with the ball. Um, you can squeeze guys. You can obviously it's very difficult to keep guys completely out of the game, but um, you know there's even Toulouse they had some devastating runners in there too, and. I think the biggest thing for us would be whenever they get touches on the ball to get excited, um, you know, not to be fearful of them, uh, to go after them. And uh, But again, like I said, if we can play our t- specific type of game, um, the, the style we want to play, hopefully, you know, they won't have too much of a say in the game. And and Rob Bax is in the past. He said it before the Toulouse semi, that you wanted to create fatigue to tire these sides out by playing lung-bursting rugby, high-tempo rugby in the first 40 in it. That plan certainly worked against Toulouse. Do you think it will work against Racing as well? Once we review them and stuff, we'll have a look at it. But um, yeah, we'll we'll look at a specific put trying to put a game plan together. We know it's an eighty minute performance, no matter what, and anything can happen. I suppose even if you look at Racing there, they've they've won the match in the last five minutes. So you know they've had to play the whole eighty to get that win. Um, so it is completely about going flat out right from the start, and hopefully you can maintain it right through the match. And if the game plan is to go and run them off their feet, well then hopefully that's what it is. But We'll worry about that on the Monday morning before we actually meet up to play. And what would it mean to the people of Exeter, Gareth, to yourself, to someone who's dedicated so much of his career at, at one club? What would it mean if you could lift the trophy? Well, it would mean everything to me. I know it would mean a lot. Well, it would mean everything to everybody here. Um, to be in the scenario that we are now, um, where I'm at in my career, if it would, you know, it would any disappointments or any regrets I'd ever have in my career would probably just go out the window because you couldn't ask for better. And um, look, I I'm just thrilled that we get the opportunity to be in a final, you know. And if we can win it, and I can be part of the first ever extra chief squad uh, that wins that, it would be a lovely way to go into retirement. And you've kicked your side to promotion to the Premiership. You've kicked them to a Premiership title. <laughs> you know, it could be your boot that that ultimately uh, could have a big say in in the outcome. How do you deal with the the mental side of of, of kicking goals when there's so much at stake? I think it's just pretty much a lot of practice over a lot of time. I think the best way to approach these things, and ones have asked me about it in in the past, is uh, these are opportunities to win games. Uh, They're not opportunities to lose games. You know, if you've got an, if you're, uh, you usually get what you deserve in rugby. And if it comes down to a kick a goal, and that's just what you're in the team to do. And if it does come down to that, well, then hopefully, you know, I can step up and put it in a straight line down the middle of the post, but hopefully it'll not come to that. <laughs> What's been fascinating is talking to a lot of current players and ex-players on this pod, and they've talked that, that teams who, who who win this thing, they have to come of age, they have to feel in their blood that they are ready to do this. Do you feel Exeter have finally come of age in Europe and are ready to to go the extra step? I think so. I think the group that we have now, there's a great little bunch of them. They're all similar sort of age. 
um, and they're all really pushing well in international stages as well. So um, there's a lot of experience amongst the squad. There's a lot of guys in there playing the World Cup final, World Cup semi-finals. You know, so for them to be in a position now to go into a Heineken Cup final, played in whatever four Premiership finals as well. Um, so there's a lot of experience amongst them. So um, in terms of the group, they're still quite young as well. So hopefully there's a few more big days ahead uh, after this one in a few weeks' time. Absolutely. And in terms of finals gone by, I mean, there have been so many thrilling ones. When, when you've looked back at, at 25 years of the Heineken Champions Cup, Gareth, what moments, what highlights stand out for you? Well, for me, it's 1999. <laughs> so it's uh, when Ulster played Columbia uh, in 1999. I was a young kid standing on the sidelines of uh, the old Lansdowne Road in the Schoolboy Terrace. And uh, I remember when Ulster went down to Dublin. And I remember getting on a bus going down as a young kid. I think I, what was I then? I must have been about 14, 15 years old. Um, and I remember standing on the sideline of the semi-final and watching David Humphreys put a chip over the top and scoring in the corner to make get in there. And that's all I ever wanted to do. And, you know, it's um, it was special moments to watch that. And that's always been in us a little bit, especially growing up back in Ulster. It was always something, you know, you wanted to play in the Heineken Cup. Um, albeit, did I ever see me doing it with extra Chiefs? <laughs> to be honest, when I joined in the championship, it would have been very hard to envisage that you know, 10 years or whatever it was, 12 years ago. But to be sitting now on the brink of it, it's obviously a very exciting time. But at the end of the day, we haven't won anything yet. And it'll mean a heck of a lot more if we can get over across the line and just playing in the final. Well, Gareth, you've had an illustrious career. It's been fabulous to watch you, to commentate on you, to see you play, to see you be so integral to Exeter's success. Um, I know once this season eventually finishes, both in the Premiership and in Europe, you'll be moving on to coaching. So the very, very best of luck from all of us. Thanks very much for having me, guys. Boy, wasn't he good. Exeter's Gareth Steenson in his final few weeks at Sandy Park. It would be so poignant, wouldn't it, if he could lift that trophy for Exeter as he bows out of professional rugby, or playing rugby, certainly, and moves on to coaching. Good luck to the Chiefs in the final. What an occasion that will be at Ashton Gate up against Racing 92, Saturday, October the 17th. Plenty more from us to come in the next few weeks. We've got another rugby legend coming up. Please subscribe to the podcast on your favourite provider. Leave us a review, but you'll hear from us again soon as we count down to the big one, the Champions Cup final. Until then, it's goodbye.